Daily news and analysis. We keep you informed and inspired. This is World Today. Hello and welcome to World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. Coming up, Chinese Premier Li Qiang is attending a series of ASEAN meetings in Laos. What are the major priorities on the agenda? China's Minister of Commerce Wang Wentao has urged the U.S. to lift sanctions on Chinese enterprises in a phone call with his American counterpart Gina Raimondo. We take a closer look at the trade and economic relations between the two countries. Japanese Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba has dissolved the lower house of parliament for a snap election. What are the calculations behind this move? Chinese Premier Li Qiang is attending the China ASEAN Summit in Laos and paying an official visit to the Southeast Asian country. He will also join the ASEAN Plus 3 Summit and the East Asia Summit in the capital, Vientiane. The summit of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations is officially underway. Leaders from the region are discussing pressing issues concerning regional development. For more, we are joined by Dr. Wang Huiyao, president of the Center for China and Globalization, a think tank based in Beijing. Well, the theme of this year's summits is enhancing connectivity and resilience. How do you think this theme reflects the major concerns and top priorities of ASEAN countries? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. I, I think the, this year's summit uh, of ASEAN, uh, which happened uh, now, is really very significant because uh, it deals with uh, the concerns, of course, uh, like connectivity and also the talk about uh, resilience. I think all those are the key issues that the ASEAN countries uh, are really uh, focus on and, and uh, also trying to improve. And I think that, uh, uh, as we know, that uh, we are living a really global time and uh, connectivity is really become a, a key issue uh, of time. And, uh, and China actually can offer uh, enormous uh, uh, support on that uh, for the connectivity and and also for resilience. I think that we have to really, uh, you know, be more connected, be more cooperative, and also uh, trying to uh, fight uh, climate change and and also all the uh, economic uh, uh, disintegration that is going on uh, for for some areas. So so it's absolutely crucial now that we have to strengthen the unity and cooperation. Uh, for ASEAN and for the countries in the region. Well, as the host of this year's summits, Laos has outlined nine key priorities under this theme, and that include uh, economic integration, digital transformation, ASEAN centrality, and climate change resilience, etc. But how can ASEAN effectively translate these priorities into concrete actions, and what role do you see China playing in supporting these efforts? Yeah, it is very important. I think ASEAN now uh, countries have realized the key areas of uh, development that uh, the bring ASEAN uh, development to to next level. I mean, ASEAN has been formed almost sixty years, and it has really uh, very uh, resilient and uh, and also uh, it, it has a six hundred million population, and and also it's the largest trading partner for China. And, uh, and and just for Vietnam, for example, it's already the fourth largest trading partner of China. You can see how sin- significant ASEAN country has developed. And then, of course, uh, the areas that uh, this year uh, theme that the Laos proposed as a host country, I think, are all are relevant. Digital, of course, it's really a big area. ASEAN to take off, and uh, China is the second largest digital country in the world and largest in the region. And and of course, also uh, uh, another example is the climate, and uh, and China has done so well. I mean, in terms of green power uh, uh, transformation, that China becomes the largest uh, 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 EV car producers now in the world, and also. Uh, solar panels and wind powers and, and hydropower. So all those things can be applied to ASEAN uh, for cooperating uh, uh, in fighting the climate uh, changes. Uh, so there, there's, uh, there's, of course, there's more. Uh, there's uh, other uh, areas of, uh, of infrastructure uh, uh, connectivity, and uh, China has already helped uh, uh, Indonesia to, to build its first uh, uh, speed railway from um, Bandung to Jakarta, and also China has precisely Laos uh, has already opened another line uh, towards Laos, and, and and also planning to build in Malaysia and also in Thailand. So you can see uh, uh, the ASEAN in the future will be super connected 
infrastructure physically, but also digitally, and then also have the new power, uh, green power trans transformation that really can tap a huge potential that China can offer. So I see this uh, cooperation, uh, which is the theme ASEAN picked for this year by Laos, is, is really highly relevant, and China can play an enormous role uh, in cooperating, in helping, and in, in strengthening ASEAN resilience. Yeah, but given the growing geopolitical complexities in the region, like um, the U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy, for example, what potential challenges do you foresee in further deepening China-ASEAN cooperation? Yes, uh, 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 that's true. Actually, on the other hand, uh, even though we have economic globalization, economic regionalization going on uh, for decades, now we're seeing the geopolitical uh, uh, disruptions as happening uh, now. For example, uh, we had uh, uh, Quad. Uh, it's happening in the region, uh, which formed by some uh, small, con small <laughs> few countries, uh, not small, but a few countries. Uh, but also uh, uh, other 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 uh, security or military uh, uh, intended uh, alliance, which I think is against the uh, uh, you know tide of time, uh, uh, you know trend of time. Basically, for example, we've been pursuing economic globalization, and ASEAN is an economic miracle, and it's an economic alliance uh, in, in its first place. We see the European Union started with economic alliance. Now ASEAN did the same, and then we see RCEP, the largest free trade agreement in the world. Uh, which is also, again, integrate everybody. So I think this kind of economic globalization, it's really the key. So so uh, we should strengthen that. I, I think that we should upgrade China, ASEAN free trade agreement, uh, upgrade that, and then so we can strengthen this uh, uh, economic, uh, commercial, and trade ties so that we can really, uh, uh, really uh, balance off those kind of military and security uh, over-securization of, of the region, which is really... Uh, put uh, each other into isolation, into conflict, and into uh, a hot spot. So uh, it's really great to have this economic integration because, for example, Vietnam is the fourth largest trading partner of, of China. And then Vietnam, I saw just yesterday, they have the highest uh, GDP growth, uh, uh, you know, over 7% 7, 7 for, for, for this year. So that's because it benefits enormously of, of investment and cooperation from China. So I think ASEAN countries don't, don't have to be pushed into picking sides. And then they really can really uh, have the best of the two worlds, but particularly the, the big neighbor of China, that they can be uh, really great. I'm even thinking of, uh, you know, like a um, uh, formal uh, statement of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, or a former statement of Malaysia. Uh, Mahathir was even one time said, let's have an Asian union, you know. <laughs> That's a great idea that we should really uh, have an Asian economic union. Let's start with China, ASEAN, but also uh, China, uh, Japan, South Korea with this uh, trilateral uh, North Asia uh, economy. So let's get this Confucius culture circle really uh, working together and uh, and then really form a culture, economic and, and trade and, and all those ties. So we can we can really dampen off. We can really. Uh, you know, uh, not get into this uh, geopolitical conflict uh, that uh, that some countries may wish to. Yes, uh, actually, the, uh, the new Japanese Prime Minister Shigeru Shiba, who has been advocating for the creation of an Asian version of NATO, he will also attend the series of summits in Laos this time. But this idea has met with skepticism in some ASEAN countries. For instance, the Jakarta Post published an editorial directly advising him to refrain from promoting that idea of an Asian NATO in order to avoid self-humiliation. So how does this stance reflect ASEAN's priority on regional stability and economic development over militarization? Yes, that's that's a very uh, bad uh, bad uh, news actually. But but I hope the new prime minister will, will not uh, uh, taking on the words he 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 said in the past because uh, that's uh, again against the tide, against the trend, against the, uh, the 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 really the development of our of our, of our era. Because uh, this is a year of economic globalization, and we had uh, finished the Second World War eighty years now almost, and then we really have to treasure, we have to cherish. Uh, the, the peaceful environment we're having. We, we should not bring NATO <laughs> from Atlantic uh, to Asia because NATO is already busy with the uh, the wars in Ukraine now, and uh, so we should really avoid that. And I think, again, uh, 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 even Japan and, and Korea, South Korea, and even North Korea and, and all of us, 
why can't we have a four party talk? I mean, the four part, you know, I mean, uh, uh, including US and uh, and the, we should really uh, stabilize the region and, and also for, for Japan, shouldn't worry uh, too much. I think, you know, China is the largest trading partner for Japan and largest trading partner for South Korea. And let's, again, using this economic incentive, using the economic and the peace dividend to really stabilize the region. And then we should not really get into the conflict situation. Again, I'm, I'm thinking of, of, about this uh, uh, Oriental culture, Con Confucius values, and, uh, and uh, let's really be peaceful. Let's be neutral. Let's not do to others. You don't wish others do to you. And uh, let's follow uh, Confucius value and then really build up the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the China, Japan and, and, and South Korea free trade agreement and have the trilateral summit. So coupled with the uh, cooperation with, with North Asia and with Southeast Asia, I think that Asia would be the next economic powerhouse of the world. And then its GDP already reached 50% of the global uh, GDP now. And uh, I'm sure we'll be leading the world development. Uh, the 21st century will be the Asian century. Uh, like uh, Kishore Mahabani mentioned uh, in our book, uh, uh, the book series that I edited uh, many times, the, the 21st century is the Asian century because of its uh, enormous potential for economic development and also the potential for peaceful development. And we should set example uh, for the rest of the world. Yeah, uh, but also uh, the Philippine president, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., will reportedly raise the South China Sea issue at the ASEAN summits, while also, you know, external powers like the U.S. and Canada have also been increasingly vocal on the matter. So how do you think China and relevant ASEAN countries can manage their disputes effectively amid growing external pressures? Yes, this is, I think there, there are some hard issues. Of course, China has differences. China has... Uh, uh, you know, there's 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 a disagreement uh, among the regions in the country, uh, but I remember, you know, many years ago, uh, uh, you know, Secretary, former Secretary of U.S. Uh, Hillary Clinton, and she said, "Oh, okay, you have a South China Sea issue, and then that's a, a a problem for the countries in the region. We don't take sides and let the country in the region to solve that." I think U.S. should should continue that uh, continue to pursue that policy rather than really uh, step in. For example. Uh, China has these uh, South China Sea issues, not only just with Philippines, but we have with uh, Vietnam, we have with Malaysia, we have with uh, Indonesia, with, with Burma. But we we'll all get along. And uh, we, ha we had all the heads of state of this country visit China. And then we talk to each other. And then, you know, we can really pursue the South China Sea code of conduct that ASEAN country and China has talked many years ago. And then let's materialize that and find specific terms how we can collaborate and how we can mutually explore and mutually benefit. And China actually will be a big uh, economic promoter uh, for the ASEAN countries. And then we will see ASEAN China super connected, uh, prosper together uh, for the future to come. So Philippines uh, should be no exception. and should really uh, uh, work along with, uh, with this uh, fundamental uh, principle of peace and prosperity rather than uh, you know, challenging the status quo uh, and, and then really making things into, into a difficult position. That's Dr. Wang Huiyao, president of the Center for China and Globalization. Chinese Commerce Minister Wang Wentao says Beijing is willing to work with Washington to put bilateral relations back on the right track. In a phone conversation with U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, Wang expressed concerns about U.S. restrictions on Chinese connected vehicles and Washington's policies toward China on semiconductors. He urged the U.S. to address the concerns of Chinese companies, lift sanctions, and improve the business environment. For more, Zhao Yang spoke with Dr. Zhou Mi, Senior Research Fellow at the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation. So, Dr. Zhou, Chinese Commerce Minister Wang Wentao held a phone call with his U.S. counterpart Raimondo. So, why do you think is it now, and what are the main topics for their discussions? Yeah, actually, it's a kind of, uh, you know, scheduled for calling by the both sides. So, they decided to communicate uh, in regular interval after they have established the mechanism of discussing the related issues between these two commerce ministers. When they are about to discuss this, I, I have to say that, you know, the situation has changed very quickly in the past uh, uh, several months. There are new developments of the policies and together with the development of the trade and investment. So they they can try to use these opportunities to explain what they are going to do with these policies and what are the main reasons they will take this uh, 
new measures. So from this uh, discussion, I, I can find that uh, most of these topics are just the following the instruction of the both leaders when they met in San Francisco last uh, uh, November. So it is kind of a very important mechanism for both sides, for the big economies to discuss about what they are, you know, have some concerns about the trade and uh, other related economic issues. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese side expressed a serious concerns over the U.S. semiconductor policy policy towards China and restrictions on Chinese connected vehicles. So how do you see this uh, U.S. policies from a technical and also a geopolitical perspective? Yeah, I mean, uh, what they are going to do is not uh, very reasonable because, you know, the world is developing very quickly in the digital economy. Almost everything are based on the semiconductors. So we know that no matter from the manufacturing to the services or other related issues, they have to be supported by the uh, kind of uh, algorithm and also some of the computing abilities. For the semiconductor, it is a very wide and interconnected corporations by the different countries and regions in the world. So they have uh, contributed a lot to the development of these sectors. So we, we can understand that U.S. has played an important role in the first phase of the developing of the semiconductor. Well, you know, in the coming uh, several years, China has provided such a big market to develop these semiconductors. And many of the semiconductors enterprises from U.S. benefit from that. So for the connected vehicles, uh, it's a really new uh, areas of development and is benefited by the development of the semiconductor and also by the transformation of the energy. So for China, we are one of the biggest markets in this uh, area and we have provided so many new brands and these uh, companies are really working hard to try to address the, you know, the demands of the consumers and provide them with uh, better services. If they are limited, I, I mean, that is definitely not good for them to improve their quality and also, uh, you know, the abilities to meet the challenges that we are facing. So with these policies, it is a very new and not so uh, friendly policies, not only to Chinese enterprises, but also to the consumers of the United States themselves. It is also uh, going to block the innovation abilities of the market. And what impact do this policy or will this policy have on the U.S. semiconductor and auto industries? In the short term, they will give us some of this, uh, the breath or some of the rest of time for those companies to, to try and to stay where they are. But it is definitely will block their abilities and the willingness to do more innovation. So they were trying to see that since there are no more competitors from outside of this market, they can just stay there and focus on what they are going to do. And they were not trying to improve the efficiency. Well, for the consumers, it's definitely not good for them to have more choices. So they may just uh, choose from several of these brands and it is not so good because if you are looking at the exhibitions in Germany, uh, where a uh, lot of Chinese automakers are providing so many fantastic uh, brands or versions of the EVs, and it has definitely attracted so many consumers. So with the competition, I mean, that will be very important for the market economy. Mm -hmm. Without that, it will definitely, uh, you know, disrupt the innovation abilities. And what kind of impact do you think the sanctions and proposed bans will have on the Chinese enterprises, particularly those involved in the connected vehicle and the uh, semiconductor sectors? Well, uh, if we are going to talk about that, I would say that uh, in the fact, there are not so many Chinese vehicles are being sold in the U.S. market. So from the statistic, it is not affected Chinese uh, automakers too much. But we cannot just uh, try to think from that way because, you know, U.S. Uh, it's not only trying to do these policies by themselves. They will also affect many other governments in the world. If they are following the suits of the United States policies, it's, it will definitely uh, trying to uh, distribute uh, and trying to uh, distort the market. And it is not good for the EVs uh, companies from China to develop their, uh, you know, space in the world. Well, from another side, I would also say that uh, these impacts are trying to gain some very bad fame to the Chinese enterprises, like they, what they are doing is not legal, or they are trying to uh, to stop the competition. Well, that is not, not the truth. 
mm. and it's definitely will uh, bring more, you know, criticize from different sides in the world. And do you see this as part of a broader U.S. strategy to curb China's growing dominance in this uh, electric vehicle and high tech industries? Definitely, because you know the EVs is a very new area. It's not only about the producing or manufacturing of the products. It is about the uh, services, about the you know a lot of more uh, diversifications of uh, development space after sale. So for the EVs, for the uh, interconnected vehicles, they are using the technology to help the drivers to improve their safety drivings and also have more. Uh, experiences when they are driving the car. So it is providing uh, such a big areas of uh, development and it is far more than just uh, producing the cars. So I, I mean that US government is trying to do more to to compete with Chinese companies by the you know disruptions of the, the government and trying to stop the Chinese companies in developing in a much quicker space. So I, I think that is a strategy. It's very, uh, I mean, harmful for the development of and the innovation of these areas. And uh, it will not only uh, stop the Chinese companies, you know, ideas about innovation or getting more profits in the U.S. market, but also interfere with their uh, plans and, uh, you know, the investment in the world. Mm. And you mentioned the innovation. So how do you see this kind of a competition? Could we see other countries will have to align more with one side over the other? Or if so, what does that mean for global supply chain and innovation? Yeah, uh, in my understanding that this uh, development or competition map is not formed right now. So it's still very early to see that the world has uh, has chosen some path for development. So we are still in the phase of competition and trying to find out which one is much better. Maybe some of the cars made by the U.S. companies are they doing better or some of others, uh, you know, performing better from China. So I, I would say that the market is very wise. We cannot just say that government can control everything. The market and the consumers have the final decision power to to find out what they are, uh, you know, their best choices are. So I would say that uh, based on that uh, logic, I would argue that many other countries are still waiting for the development uh, of these EVs and trying to look at what they can, you know, give the consumers a better performance and what can they can do to improve the structure of the industries and supporting the transfer of the, you know, the energy usage to the new one to meet their commitments. So actually, uh, I don't think that uh, all the other countries, even from the Western side, they will just uh, follow U.S. government practices. They, they have to wait and see what will happen in the coming days or years. Mm. And for China-U.S. economic relations, so in which areas do you think the two countries can still have room or potential for cooperation? And what should the U.S. government do to improve the business climate for Chinese enterprises operating there? So the cost is very high for the U.S. consumers and also the enterprises. So if they are able to provide a better and diversified you know, supply from different countries is definitely well benefic beneficiary uh, for the consumers. So I think that for the cooperation between China and the United States, we may have two uh, pos possible ways of uh, or directions of cooperation. The first one is on the traditional, you know, uh, the industry and sectors, uh, no matter in the, you know, machineries or some of the textiles, we can still try to strengthen the supply chains between us. That is to say that we should we should try to reduce the barriers like the tariffs uh, of the import from China. Well, the other side is about the innovative ways for addressing the challenges because no country can do this alone, like for fighting against the climate change or trying to address the challenges from the AI and other technology improvement. We need to have, uh, you know, the unified or at least a uh, uh, even bigger and uh, more integrated markets by the both sides. And that is definitely very important for us to try to find out the criteria and principles to support the development of these uh, sectors and the beneficial to other uh, countries in the world. That's Dr. Zhou Mi, Senior Research Fellow at the Chinese Academy of International Trade and Economic Cooperation, speaking with Zhao Yang. This is World Today. Stay with us.
This is World Today. I'm Zhao Yang. China has condemned the U.S. government's recent approval of military aid to the Taiwan region. A Chinese defense ministry spokesperson said on Wednesday that the U.S. move has severely undermined China's sovereignty and disrupted peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. The spokesperson also urged the U.S. to cease its duplicity on the Taiwan question and avoid further damaging the China-U.S. bilateral and military-to-military relations. Late last month, the U.S. government approved 567 million U.S. dollars in new defense aid for Taiwan, covering funding for training, anti-armor systems, and drones. For more on this, my colleague Ding Hong spoke with Dr. Xiao Yuqun, senior research fellow at Shanghai Institute of International Studies. So, thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Xiao Yuqun. Um, here、uh, we are talking about. Actually, one of Washington's largest ever military aid packages for Taiwan. The aid will be provided via the U.S. Presidential Drawdown Authority. So, what do you think the Biden administration is attempting to do or attempting to achieve by approving this package?、Um, we know that the U.S. Presidential Drawdown Authority is not、uh, the normal or regular. Uh, way for the U.S. to sell arms to Taiwan.、Uh, it's a new format.、Mm. Um, I think the U.S. government, their basic thinking is that、uh, the delivery of U.S. weapons to Taiwan, the regular、uh, arms sales, the delivery has met a lot of challenges. Uh, uh, several cases have been delayed, and that has got a lot of criticism from the U.S. Congress. So that's why the Biden administration has tried to use the U.S. presidential drawdown authority,、uh, namely th- that the U.S. can、uh, get the arms weapons from the reserve to、uh, give it to Taiwan. So、uh, the main purpose is try to deter the so-called deter the Chinese mainland not to use military means to take Taiwan back, and.、Uh, So, so this is the focus right now of the Biden administration's policy towards Taiwan.、Um, within their framework, their understanding is that、uh, the asymmetric、uh, advantage of the Chinese mainland militarily、uh, has become increasing、uh, rapidly, and、uh, the logic is when your capability is rising, your intention will. Uh, change.、Mm. So, from the Biden administration's perspective, and also in the framework of great power competition with China,、uh, they try to send more arm,、uh, arms and weapons to Taiwan in order to raise Taiwan's capability to defend itself, and try to deter the Chinese mainland. That's why we have seen、uh, the largest ever military aid packages、uh, from Washington to Taiwan recently. Hmm. So, why do you think,、um, in Beijing's perception, at least, this、uh, this continued U.S. arms transfers to Taiwan is provocative and represents some kind of violation of some communiques that that the United States and China have jointly issued、um, in the past? Basically, two things. First of all. Uh, between China and the United States,、uh, there are three communiques, right? The second communique, August the third,、uh, August the seventeenth, it's mainly about、uh, U.S. arms sale to Taiwan, and、uh, within that communique, the U.S. side、uh, has has promised that it would uh, uh, decrease and its、uh, arms sales, arms transfer to Taiwan. So from this perspective, the United States has not、uh, kept its promise.、Uh, On the contrary, it has increased its arms sales to Taiwan. Secondly,、uh, we should look at the domestic politics in Taiwan.、Uh, right now, the DPP authority has、uh, adopted the policy towards a mainland. It's very provocative.、Mm. Uh, it's like the two-state theory or one China, one Taiwan theory. So,、um, if we combine these two things together. The U.S.、Uh, continued arms sales and increasing arms transfers to Taiwan will send, has already sent, and will continue to send very、uh, wrong signal to the DPP authority that it's okay for you to promote this kind of very dangerous and provocative policy towards the Chinese mainland.、Mm, I take your point. So,、um, by the way, recently there was actually this revelation about a scandal 
where uh, a U.S. defense contractor named RTX was um, was found to be involved in some overpricing cases, which was problematic and possibly illegal. And Taiwan was actually found to be among the buyers affected, have, having been reportedly overcharged by some uh, 250 million U.S. dollars in two particular uh, procurement deals. Uh, what do you think the scandal here might tell us about about the U.S. arms transfers to Taiwan? First of all, this scandal is not an isolated case. Uh, if we look back to the history, uh, the U.S. arms sales to Taiwan, we can find a lot of cases uh, like this kind of scandals. And uh, it's, uh, it's very... Uh, um, Kind of a common if you talk to the uh, Taiwan military officers, officials, and those politicians, scholars, they have all well known uh, about these kinds of uh, un, uh, imbalanced uh, relationship between the United States and Taiwan. Uh, so I think this kind of scandals uh, can tell us that the DPP authorities' policy has been completely wrong. It's a big strategic mistake that. Uh, DPP authority has put Taiwan security and Taiwan people's safety on uh, the U.S. side. It uh, decides to wait for the United States to offer Taiwan security. Instead, uh, it tried to de-link its relationship with the Chinese mainland. Strategically, it's very short-sighted and very wrong. Um, so within Taiwan, there are a lot of scholars intellectuals and the former officials have criticized DPP's policy on this front. But so far, uh, we haven't seen any um, rethinking on the DPP uh, side. Mm. So China's foreign ministry um, has recently announced the sanctions against the nine uh, U.S. companies over arms sales to Taiwan. What do you think is the key message from China here? I think the the, the message has been very strong and clear, which is uh, China is strongly against U.S. Uh, arms sales to Taiwan. So for those U.S. companies, uh, if you uh, have been involved into these arms sales to Taiwan, then uh, China's uh, signal is no, we don't want to see that. So if you want to do those cases, then you will face sanction from the Chinese side. So the message has been clear and strong. I think those companies have already got the message. And so let's wait and see and see the next step of those companies, whether they would they prefer these uh, arms sales to Taiwan or they prefer a larger uh, market of China, of the Chinese mainland or their relationship with the Chinese mainland. That's Dr. Xiao Yuqun, Senior Research Fellow at Shanghai Institute for International Studies, speaking with my colleague Ding Heng. You're listening to World Today. We'll be back. This is World Today. I'm Zhao Yang. Japanese Prime Minister Shigeru Ishiba has dissolved the House of Representatives for a snap election on October 27th. The move came just eight days after Ishiba came into office. With the early election, Ishiba is seeking to secure a majority in the lower house for the governing Liberal Democratic Party. For more, we are joined on the line by Dr. Rong Ying, Senior Research Fellow with the China Institute of International Studies. Dr. Rong, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So what do you think motivated Ishiba to dissolve the lower house just eight days after taking office? Well, I think the uh, new uh, prime minister of Japan, after winning the uh, sort of uh, election, and usually it's kind of a routine practice for him uh, or her to seek uh, a election, a snap election to consolidate uh, his power I mean, uh, as a parliament. Uh, but uh, this time, I think Ishiba is different. Uh, in the sense that... Uh, he is not uh, necessarily want to uh, consolidate the power as the uh, routine practice goes. More importantly, I think he's uh, gaming. He, I mean, he's gam- to some extent gambling on uh, whether uh, he will be able to establish 
or consolidate its positions by seeking uh, the support of the public instead of the party. Because Ishiba is uh, a, a kind of unconventional uh, politician, and he himself has, uh, I think, has some problems with the other factions or is, is seeking a kind of factionless uh, sort of politics in LDP. So uh, dissolving the, uh, house, the lower house is the only way for him to survive, to consolidate, uh, despite the fact that it, has, uh, it seems that it has some high risk. And that's why risk. That's why I think he made the announcement unofficial. Even he officially presume, I mean, assumed the prime ministership, which was criticized by the opposition parties, which as unconstitutional. Yeah, so as you said, Ishiba has emphasized the importance of seeking a direct mandate from the public. So how crucial is this election for his administration, especially if uh, you consider uh, the recent corruption scandals involving the LDP? Well, I think numbers, seats matter. At this moment, uh, the LDP, uh, uh, with, uh, together, in, uh, together with its uh, coalition partners, the Comito, I think they have uh, uh, 290 uh, seats. And in Japan's lower house, I mean, the total number is 465. And if the LDP, I mean, by itself, they will be able to win half, which is 233, that would be a, a, a sort of a, a good, uh, a, 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 I mean, it's a kind of a grade that it passes. But I think that these things, uh, or the, the, that uh, uh, Ishiba Prime Minister is looking for, that at least the seats he is going to have after the election were not less than the current one, which I think uh, LDP is now having 258. This is uh, quite a, a challenge for him, taking into account this election commission, I mean, situation and the speculations. I think uh, Ishiba. Uh, uh, himself, I, I mean the public that has been talking about. Yeah, but on the other hand, we see that the opposition parties are rather fragmented uh, currently. So how might this impact their ability to challenge the LDP in the upcoming election? And do you think this fragmentation is a significant advantage of Ishiba? Well, that's a great question. I think the challenge does not come from the opposition parties, even though this time, I think the opposition parties uh, the uh, Constitutional Democratic Party in Japan and others uh, are working very hard on that. The challenges, the problem comes from within. I think Ishiba, after uh, taking after taking over, the uh, first sort of uh, uh, opinion poll made him at uh, sort of fifty one percent. That is the uh, latest. I mean, the lowest uh, since two thousand two. In other words, uh, Ishiba, despite the the, uh, I mean, the, the, his effort is not so popular on that. And if he's not able to work out, I mean, by winning over the overall support of the party, LDP, and that could become uh, uh, problematic for his, uh, I mean, p- political career even before it uh, started. And uh, the big problem, big challenges come from the opposition from uh, his uh, sort of uh, position vis-à-vis the late Prime Minister Abe section and also related to his uh, positions on the uh, political scandals and how he would manage uh, the, uh, these uh, politicians that have been uh, involved in these scandals. There are reports that they originally he was thinking of to endorse them, and now I think he has decided not to do that. Instead, as I said, that he would like to seek at the in his words, put in the the issue in the hands of voters. Okay. Well, but critics have claimed that uh, the SNAP election prioritizes electoral strategy over substantive policy debate. How would you assess the implications of this for Japan's political discourse and the ability to address some pressing issues? Yeah, I think uh, in some sense, the opposition parties are reasonable or have a point in in the sense that um, the uh, uh, Prime Minister Shiba is weak, 
and his party may not necessarily, I mean, stand by himself. And if the election turned out to be uh, that uh, he lose some seats instead of gain them, and those losers are, are mainly, or if they were mainly from the opposi- opposition sort of factions of uh, Prime Minister Shiba, then it would of course again, I mean, uh, uh, which means that he will be facing big problems. And that, if a weaker, even though he does not lose, and if, I mean, but the losing seats, which means he's weaker. And if he's weak, then I think he would, does not have the uh, have little political leverages or capital to pursue the reform and uh, the policy agenda that he wanted to have push. Yeah. So, what is the current sentiment among voters regarding Ishiba's early election call? Like, uh, given the low approval ratings of the previous government, how might this influence voter behavior in the snap election? I think it's a half and a half. Uh, the uh, some opinion polls put the, the um, in the public. I mean, uh, so the forty forty five something are supporting that, while the equal, almost equal members. Numbers are, are, are sort of are, are, are not happy with that, so it is it is a kind of half and half sort of uh, 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 probabilities where how I mean uh, Shiba would be able to fulfill his goal by calling an early uh, and snap election. Yeah. So, what key issues do you anticipate will dominate uh, the election campaign? Well, the key issue has always been, I mean, economy. Uh, there we know that Japan's economy um, is, I mean, there are certainly structural issues, the demographic, the aging population, so on. So, but the, there are other issues uh, related to, I think, the policy orientation that has been uh, pursued. For example, I think uh, Prime Minister Ishiba very much wanted to focus on growth, so-called growth-oriented. In which, which means that he would put uh, uh, the emphasis on increase of uh, wages and investment, uh, and uh, and manage particularly manage the question of rising prices. This, of course, would be welcomed by uh, the public. But how to address the, these issues? We are talking about raising tax, personal and corporate tax. That is not happy. I mean, and that's mm-hmm. not a good. Good news for the business community. That's why the Japanese business community, uh, I think, is quite uneasy about that. The other issue is, of course, the political reform. Uh, I think the public uh, would like to see more uh, that has been done in response to the political, I mean, the scandals of uh, LDP. But that is, again, very much related to, I think, the internal differences between um, the problems between uh, his, uh, Ishiba, Prime Minister Ishiba, and the Sanctions of former, I mean, factions of former Prime Minister uh, Abe and other strong sort of uh, uh, candidate. I mean, I mean, powerful politicians within the party. So always been tricky, and uh, uh, for him to manage to just strike a balance. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Dr. Rowing, senior research fellow with the China Institute of International Studies. This is World Today. We'll be back. You're listening to World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. Israel is expanding its ground operation in Lebanon with the deployment of a new army division. The reservist 146th moved into southern Lebanon overnight, just hours after Israel announced the mobilization of a third standing division. The number of troops on the ground is now likely to number 15,000. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israeli forces have killed thousands of Hezbollah members, including the successor of the group's late leader, Hassan Nasrallah. Meanwhile, the UN Special Coordinator for Lebanon and the head of the UN Peacekeeping Force warned in a joint statement that the humanitarian impact of the conflict was nothing short of catastrophic. For more, we are joined on the line by Zhang Chuchu, Deputy Director of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Fudan University. Professor Zhang, thanks for joining us. So with Israel's recent military operations and Hezbollah's responses, how do you assess the current state of the conflict? Uh, well, I think the situation is rapidly deteriorating, and we see that Israel and Hezbollah are facing their most intense moment um, in nearly 20 years. So right now, Netanyahu's goal 
in Lebanon is to cripple Hezbollah's ability to launch attacks on Israel. And also he's pursuing a so-called three-step strategy. Uh, the first step is to, tar- uh, is to launch the targeted assassinations of senior um, Hezbollah military and political leaders. And his second step is to deploy some ground troops to eliminate um, key Hezbollah military facilities in the southern um, Lebanon. And the third step is to establish the so-called security zones in southern Lebanon. However, uh, it is very important to note that Hezbollah is very good at using the local terrain uh, to uh, for um, guerrilla warfare. And also uh, the Israeli military has already faced uh, losses after sending in some ground troops. Now, this leaves um, Israel in a dilemma. Should it halt its operations right now without fully achieving its objectives? Or are, is it going to shift some of the forces deployed in Gaza to Lebanon. If it chooses the latter, then it may struggle to meet its goals in Gaza. Yeah, so if you look at the response from Hezbollah, because on on the one hand, they are continuing to fight back, but also it has officially said it supports efforts aimed at achieving a ceasefire in Lebanon, and it dropped Gaza truce as a condition for Lebanon's ceasefire. So how does this shift reflect their current strategic calculations? Right. So an important context is that right now the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas has already been deadlocked for some time. And if a truce in Gaza is a precondition, that means that Hezbollah and Israel will have very little room for negotiation. And I believe right now um, Hezbollah's attitudes um, reflect two key calculations of itself. The first one is um, Hezbollah does not want to see an escalation of sectarian um, tensions within Lebanon. Uh, so when Israel claims that its operations are focused solely on Hezbollah and not the other Lebanese groups, um, Hezbollah attempts to present itself um, as also seeking a ceasefire, much like the rest of Lebanon. Uh, and the second issue is that Hezbollah has recently suffered significant losses, with many of its leaders killed. And also um, there were uh, the major explosions which have revealed that traditional um, communication methods are no longer reliable for it. So right now, uh, Hezbollah has to buy some time to restructure internally and also improve its communication systems. However, um, I think Israel is unwilling to give Hezbollah the chance to reorganize itself, and it aims to continue targeting Hezbollah's military infrastructure in southern Lebanon. So it's not ready to um, withdraw at this moment, which makes the uh, prospects of these talks uh, more difficult. Then what do you think are Israel's long-term objectives or, uh, let's say, end game in this multi-front conflict? Mm -hmm. Well, Netanyahu has kept emphasizing his three objectives in Gaza and recently has has also announced a new objective in Lebanon. But based uh, based on my analysis, I would say the long-term objectives and logics are threefold. Uh, So um, above all, Netanyahu tries to achieve the so-called absolute safety for Israel. And secondly, he tries to create an extremely hotline image in the Middle East and carry out um, strategic deterrence against neighboring countries in the expectation that no one will dare to attack Israel. And the third objective is to alter the geopolitical landscape in the Middle East and undermine Iran's influence. Now, None of these objectives are easy to achieve, and at present we see that it might demonstrate its military advantage at some point, but it becomes further away from realizing these objectives since the resentment against Israel is there and it has already become very widespread in the region. Uh, So I'm worried about the long-term influence of this conflict. Okay. And in the meantime, uh, we see that Iranian foreign minister is on a trip to Saudi Arabia and some other countries in the region. How do you think the talks between, um, let's say, Saudi Arabia and Iran might help prevent a further escalation of the situation? Uh, well, the regional dynamics of the Middle East involve a very complex power struggle between three countries, that is Israel, Iran and Saudi Arabia. So Iran and Saudi Arabia have long been engaged in a regional proxy conflict. Iran anticipates that Israel is likely to, to launch retaliatory uh, operations and is particularly concerned that at this moment maybe pro-Saudi um, armed groups in the region, such as those in Yemen or Syria, might seize the opportunity to attack pro-Iranian forces and thereby weaken um, Iran's regional influence. So as a result, Iran's recent diplomatic efforts may serve two purposes. On the one hand, it tries to strengthen um, policy coordination with, its, uh, with Saudi 
And also, uh, secondly, I think it tries to to shape public opinion by presenting itself as a defender um, of Arab interests against Israel, thereby putting pressure on Saudi Arabia and the other Arab states. Well, Israel's Defense Minister Yuav Gallant was expected to visit Washington on Wednesday, but his trip was postponed with a last-minute decision by Benjamin Netanyahu. So how does this move reflect the current state of relations between the Biden administration and the Netanyahu government? Uh huh. So the reasons for the delay in Gallant's trip have not yet been fully explained. Uh, however, according to Israeli news reports, we can see that Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu is preventing Gallen from traveling to the United States for a one-day visit uh, until uh, Biden calls him directly. So Netanyahu has planned a retaliatory strike against Iran for its missile attack, but he has held off on, on launching the operation as he's still waiting for Biden's position on the matter. Um, and recently, it's very interesting that Biden spoke by phone with Israeli President um, Herzog, but has not yet uh, contacted um, Netanyahu, and this has likely made Netanyahu very uneasy, as he may feel marginalized by Biden's decision to engage with uh, Herzog, Gallant, and the other Israeli politicians. Uh, so by insisting that Gallant postpone the trip, I think Netanyahu aims to assert his role as Israel's decision maker to both mm. Biden and his colleagues in Israel. Yes, thank you, Professor Zhang Chuchu, Deputy Director at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Fudan University. And that's all the time we have for this edition of World Today. To listen to this episode again or to catch up on previous episodes, you can download our podcast by searching World Today. I'm Zhao Ying. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time.